This is Indian Country Today. Esquili Rate'e. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Talonhungva. Here are the headlines for Wednesday, December 16th. U.S. Representative and Laguna Pueblo citizen Deb Holland is in talks with the Biden administration to become the Interior Secretary. That's according to a source who is familiar with the talks. For the past several weeks, tribes, tribal organizations, and other groups have sent letters and expressed their desire to see Holland appointed to this cabinet position. If she is tapped and confirmed, Holland would make history as the first Native American to lead a cabinet agency. Yet Democrats worry the move would leave them with a very thin majority in the House. She is currently vice chair of the House Natural Resources Committee. The Interior protects the nation's natural resources and is in charge of upholding the government's federal trust responsibilities to tribes. The agency also oversees the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Bureau of Indian Education and it manages America's public lands and coastal waters. The Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Task Force in Minnesota is releasing a report of its findings. The group was created last year and had unanimous bipartisan support. The task force found the root cause of MMIW injustices are based in colonization, historical trauma, racism, sexism, and sexual objectification. According to the report, Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit people are far more likely to experience violence, and those groups go missing are, or are, and are killed at higher rates than any other group in Minnesota. White Earth Ojibwe citizen and Minnesota Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan says action is needed. The coronavirus vaccine is making its way to millions of people across the nation. In remote western Alaska, villages are preparing to receive more than 35,000 doses, and the state is no stranger to viral pandemics. The operation is called Project Togo, and it's named for the sled dog who led a life-saving antitoxin delivery to Nome in 1925. That year's infamous diphtheria outbreak plunged rural Alaska into quarantine. And now, almost a century later, officials are hoping the current vaccine delivery will mirror the success of its namesake. Pressure continues to mount for the ABC TV series Big Sky. Tribal leaders and organizations say the high rate of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in the state the show takes place in is missing. And the chairman of the Confederated and Salish Kootenai Tribes, Shelley Fiant, says using photos of her tribe's seal and tribal buildings in the series is not enough. The producers say they have sought guidance from the National Congress of American Indians. The actor, Stephanie Mathias, was hired for a role. She's from Squamish Nation and was asked to act as a consultant for the series. Mathias says the show simply does not have the knowledge of working with indigenous people. The Navajo Nation and the University of Arizona's James E. Rogers School of Law are partnering on a program to increase the number of native Navajo lawyers. The agreement will establish the Navajo Law Fellowship Program. The program's overall goal is to increase the number of Navajo Law School students and graduates and to create pathways to legal careers. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez says the new fellowship program creates another way for Navajo students to come home and give back to their communities. The nation and the university will match financial aid awards to Navajo Law School students who are in the program. If you're looking to shop for Indigenous artists and small businesses this holiday season, you're in luck. We have a list to find unique, one-of-a-kind gifts as well as online events. The Native Action Network hosted a pop-up virtual shopping event this week, which featured items made by Indigenous artists. Organizers say these events are like QVC, but for Indian country. The list of online events and shops is posted on our website. And to wrap those gifts, Molly of Denali has you covered. PBS Kids for Parents created Molly Wrapping Paper this year. You download the wrapping paper from the PBS website and color it yourself to create your unique paper to wrap your gifts. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today for Wednesday, December 16th. I'm Patty Tholhungva. Coming up, what should tribes understand as the COVID-19 vaccines arrive? We'll talk with the pandemic expert when we come back.
All during this pandemic, we've reported on the rising cases of COVID-19 in Indian country. We've interviewed tribal leaders about how they are dealing with this virus and what impact it's having on both their people and their economies. The answer is this pandemic is hitting Indian country very hard. Even with the promise of a coronavirus vaccine, there's still a fair amount of fear about getting this vaccine. Indian country has a long history of mistrust of the U.S. government when it comes to medical procedures. Even though medical aid is one of the rights spelled out in treaties and is a federal obligation to tribes. So as the vaccines come to your local health facility, what should you know about them? From the start of this pandemic, we've turned to Dean Seneca for answers, perspective and advice. Dean is Seneca Indian, and for many years he worked at the Center for Disease Control in the area of infectious disease and pandemics. And he has boots on the ground experience when it comes to fighting a pandemic. In 2014, he went to the West African country of Sierra Leone and helped lead the fight against the Ebola pandemic. Today, he is the CEO of Seneca Scientific Solutions Plus. Welcome, Dean. Thanks for having me, Patty. What parallels can you draw from your experience in Sierra Leone to Indian country and the coronavirus pandemic? Well, you know, when I was in Sierra Leone, um, you know, I was surprised to believe how many people did not believe, did not think that Ebola was real. You know, that uh, this was something that was brought on. It was witchcraft. It was a bunch of lies. And it's so amazing to see that same attitude in many uh, people within the United States. You know, um, I, I mean, I feel like saying, you know, we're the United States. We're the leaders in all of this. This should not be us that have some of the same beliefs and mentalities as folks in third world countries. You know, we we are the example, you know, but uh, unfortunately, you know, we're seeing a lot of this and that, you know, kind of neglect uh, that attitude and that behavior, which reflects in how we behave. Uh, is assisting in the transmission of the virus. So um, there are some similarities uh, in that matter. Um, well, we have seen throughout the, this whole uh, summer of pandemic, people refusing to wear face coverings, even though it's a CDC guideline, and then to maintain social distancing. We're seeing fights break out. So, you know, again, looking at how people are facing this pandemic and what kind of information they're believing when it comes to this virus outbreak. So right from day one, even before people were arguing about wearing a face mask or not, my perspective was wear a face mask, you know, wear a bandana, you know, wear a covering, um, you know, and the, the beginning of the debate was really, you know, so that the general public didn't buy up all the face masks and we didn't have face masks for our healthcare providers, you know, so that's why they're basically saying, you know, uh, holding off on the general public going and buying face masks because we wanted to make sure our healthcare providers were well equipped. But that is all changed right now. And the science di dictates that if you wear a mask, you are reducing your risk significantly of coming into contact with this virus. So please wear a mask. I don't see what the problem is. It's a two dose vaccine. You know, the person comes in, gets their first shot, and then they have to return for the second shot to make it effective. Um, how easy is it to manage people and get them to return for that second shot? Well, Patty, just to let you know, um, in my work, uh, I did a stop assignment in Ethiopia, and that was to stop the transmission of polio. So I have uh, a lot of knowledge about uh, vaccines. And the polio vaccine is distributed, they, the CDC recommends four doses. And, and here's the issue. Uh, and we're going to see this issue in Indian country. We're seeing it related to diabetes and other illnesses, you know, especially when people have to drive a far distance, hours, just to get health care. Uh, we saw this a lot with diabetes. Um, that, yes, people are going to get the first dose, but coming back to get the second dose, are people going to be able to do that and do that effectively? Um, it, that could be a challenge. Uh, I know when I was in Ethiopia, it was a huge challenge. We could never get anybody to come back for that second dose, you know, because they were in the bush, they were traveling long distances. And I could see that challenge in, in many of, uh, of our, um, our tribal regions, you know, North and South Dakota, you know, Alaska, for example, um, and, you know, throughout all of Indian country, because Indian country is very rural in nature and character anyway. So, you know, getting the first vaccine, I think that that is going to be easy. Getting the return for people to take the second shot, I think is going to be the challenge. 
Dean, who do you think should get the vaccines first? So, you know, the whole distribution, because I, this is what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that tribes are going to just adopt what the rest of the country is doing because they don't really have not uh, dug deep into these issues. And every vaccine, every dose is precious, right? So I would rather inoculate my elderly because time is ticking. Time is ticking. And, you know, we all, you know, we're always criticized for having small populations and we're insignificant. Well, guess what? This is the role reversal a little bit. You know, every dose is critically important. That means every dose should be given, in my opinion, to our elders first and then those at risk second um, because they're so precious. You know, um, so, I, you know, kind of backing up to um, going to my point is, um, you know, if we put it in the context of Indian country and you're only given 300 vaccines, if your healthcare workforce is all non Indian, you know, I'm sorry. And I apologize. And we appreciate everything you've done for our native community, but these vaccines are supposed to go to Indian people. Right. So if you're, if you're going to take, you know, 50 of those vaccines to, to vaccinate your healthcare workforce, that could be 50 elders in which, you know, we will not lose and we will not lose our culture. We will not lose our language. We will not lose our customs and traditions like we already great. So greatly have, uh, for example, at Navajo nation. Um, you know, we, we just can't afford to do that. And, um, and, and, that, and that's my perspective. I just hope tribal leaders really think this through, you know, because this is what I think about healthcare workers. Healthcare workers are awesome, right? But they're well protected. They have PPE on all the time. You know, the uh, infection rate among healthcare workers is relatively low than those that are vulnerable and at risk. You know what I mean? So, you know, the strategy because of our small populations really would be to value every dose of that vaccine and that go to our most precious resource and that is our elderly. So you're partnering with other groups to address this pandemic. Tell us about the Indigenous Pandemic Response Alliance. So basically uh, it's a group of uh, folks that I've partnered with who are uh, very knowledgeable about pandemic response uh, specifically regarding testing. So what this group, what we were trying to do is focusing on, you know, getting test kits and getting testing kit capability uh, amped up uh, throughout Indian country uh, to complement a lot of what IHS is doing. Also, the other things that we're doing is we're doing like pandemic planning and response. Uh, I have been providing lectures and things regarding the mental and behavioral health components. Um, uh, for, uh, for example, for managers and, and upper management and casinos, uh, you know, how to, you know, deal with the uh, COVID pandemic and, and managing their employees, uh, making sure that they're all well, you know, keeping stress levels low uh, and making sure that our, you know, our tribal operations, our casinos are not an avenue to spread the virus. So that's basically uh, what we've been focusing on is, is rapid testing contact tracing and providing some, you know, mental and behavioral health uh, uh, relief, stress relief for, you know, managers, upper management and uh, many staff and components that are involved in emergency response uh, with our tribal nations. So that's what we've been working on. And as you look into 2021, you know, um, how long before we're out of the woods when it comes to this pandemic and with the vaccine that's now being uh, given out to people? Well, I, I see that the next three months or four months until at least April, as the weather is cold, is going to be our biggest and, and hugest challenges uh, um, in, in order to, you know, stop the transmission, lower hospitalization rates and lower death rates. I think it's going to be a huge, a huge problem. Uh, and, and I think it's going to be our biggest challenge in Indian country, especially when we have so many people in a single family home especially when we have so many generations in a single family home. So, you know, I don't really see us out of the light. And I said maybe July, they're going to start administering the vaccine if everything goes right to the general population. So Dean, what should schools be doing right now? Many had students return to the classroom only to have outbreaks that sent everyone home again. Uh, when will it truly be safe for schools to reopen? Well, you know, I, again, you know, that question is, is very difficult to answer because it really is dependent upon local resources. 
uh, local policies and, you know, how people are, you know, kind of managing the pandemic. Um, you know, we, we, we can't make a universal blanket statement, you know, people, uh, students should be, be back in schools if we have all the necessary precautions in place, right? Everybody, you have the ability to safe social distance. You have the testing ability where you can constantly continue to test and test teachers and test students uh, frequently. You know, that's key to reopening schools. Um, the other is the, you know, is the commitment from parents. You know, parents have to be uh, intimately involved uh, with their children as they're, you know, going to school. That means that, you know, kids have to have, you know, proper face masks, you know, proper sanita sanitation or sanitizers for hand sanitizers. Um, you know, they have to have things on them in order to clean surfaces. You know, um, I mean, it's a whole effort in order to put a child back into school and have them in a learning environment where people, where it's a confined space, you know. Uh, my suggestion, and I have been saying this right from the beginning, is that if we can, you know, work online, learn online, and have some sort of tutoring, tutoring capability uh, for our students in the home, uh, that's ideal, right? Um, but here again, we have another struggle, and that is internet access. You know, I'm finding out throughout the whole country, including in uh, uh, my tribal community, that internet access is a huge challenge. And we're only, you know, 30 minutes from a major met metropolitan city, right? And then even in ruler parts, if you went uh, south to the Allegheny Territory, it, sometimes it's even more challenging. So, you know, uh, all of these different things have to be worked out. You know, I can't just say, you know, uh, for school to... Uh, uh, for all schools to open or for all schools to, to stay closed. It really depends upon the local um, outbreak and response, how that pandemic, how cases are rising or not rising in the local community to make a determination to open schools. Dean Seneca is the CEO of Seneca Scientific Solutions Plus. Thank you so much for joining us, Dean. Thank you for having me, Patty. When we come back, the long process to get federal recognition for the Lumbees. There are 574 federally recognized tribes in the country, and some states also recognize tribes. That's the case for the Lumbee Indians in North Carolina. Marionette Pember is a national correspondent for Indian Country Today, and she joins us now to tell us about a story she recently filed called Lumbee Goes Before Congress for Federal Recognition Again. Welcome, Marionette. Hi, Patty. How are you? Good. Well, this has been a really long process for the Lumbee. Give us some background. Yeah, really long process. They um, were apparently first um, recognized by the state in 1885. And um, they did, uh, they've been seeking then federal recognition since 1889. So yeah, I, I would call that a super long process. And what has been the holdup? Because, you know, other tribes have spent you know, maybe decades working on getting federal recognition and then they achieve that. You know, there is a long process outlined, but um, what has been holding up the Lumbee's uh, effort to get re federal recognition? Well, unfortunately, there's not, no short answer to that question. Um, they had an instance in the 50s um, when they were actually recognized by the uh, federal government, but that was during the termination era. And it was decided that they were, it's just strangely, they were recognized and terminated in one fell swoop. So they like were recognized by name, but then they were denied um, services. And I think the, the of course that was the, the era of termination. So that was sort of the milieu in which that happened. But I think the feeling was that it would be too expensive to recognize them for the federal government because they're quite a large group of people. 
So subsequently, they uh, then tried uh, their, for a time, they did try to gain recognition through the Department of the Interior, which is really kind of the traditional way that most tribes achieve recognition. It's quite a lengthy process. You have to provide a great deal of documentation and anthropological um, proof, historical proof, um, you know, internal documents, and they began that process. But then the D interior decided, the Department of Interior decided, well, that since you folks were first recognized briefly and terminated by an act of Congress, you're going to have to pursue recognition once again by, um, you know, getting going through the Congress. So that's what they have been doing here most recently. Uh, however, another rub, in 2016, the Department of Interior announced that they could go through the Department of Interior process, but I did speak to their uh, chairman, Godwin, and he said that they were pursuing, rather than the Department of Interior process, the congressional process. And um, the Lumbee Recognition Act has come before the House and has passed at the House level several times, but it seems to be getting stuck in the Senate. Is that, do you think, you know, do they think it's going to be that case again, or do they think this time the Senate will pass their, their Recognition Act? Well, I think they have great hopes. Um, there is a lot of uh, now, they have a lot of political juice, as it were. Um, I, if you recall during the uh, last presidential campaign, um, we're not absolutely sure, but we're pretty sure that they actually, the Lumbee tribe were the only um, indigenous peoples uh, that uh, were visited, but that Donald Trump visited. Um, also, Donald Trump and uh, President-elect, who uh, now I guess essentially President Biden, uh, have both publicly said that they would recognize the Lumbees if it comes across their desk. Also, they have a great deal of support for their legislators. Uh, both the House and senators there in Georgia have uh, uh, support uh, the recognition bill. Also, they have a great deal of support uh, in the House. Um, the uh, committee, uh, subcommittee, House subcommittee rather, uh, on uh, uh, Indigenous peoples has uh, an, an, you know, also announced their support. It, and what I think that's so what underlies that is that they occupy an area of North Carolina, which is a swing state and therefore very important politically. And they're, as I said, at least 60,000 people. They are essentially, you know, they are one of the largest populations in a, the county of Robeson. And they do occupy a, a number of counties surrounding there, though that uh, Robeson County. So they they do actually hold a great deal of political power. Therefore, you know, right now among politicians, um, I think it would look, um, it, it's not politically wise to oppose their recognition. So uh, why the Senate in the past has not, um, has not granted recognition of the bill, I'm not, I can't say for sure. Um, I do know that in the past, Senator uh, John McCain, who has now uh, passed away, he opposed uh, their recognition. And he, of course, as you know, is with the Senate Committee of uh, uh, American Indian Affairs. So historically, what has happened, I think something like 16 times, is that they have passed the House, the recognition bill has passed the House, only then to fail to uh, get through the Senate. So this year, however, it has the, uh, the recognition bill is uh, going to be tacked on, the word is, it's going to be tacked on to the omnibus uh, uh, bill, kind of, it's sort of a catch-all bill to fund the uh, federal government, you know, the shutdown, if they don't come to, to some sort of agreement in, con in Congress, uh, the shutdown will happen on Friday. Um, so if it's tacked on, you know, to this omnibus bill, and uh, if it passes, uh, they would be recognized. Wow. Yet there are a number of tribes, federally recognized tribes, that are opposing this recognition process for the Lumbees. Uh, why is that? Correct, quite a number of tribes. Um, well, you know, uh, uh, the, the Lumbees and their supporters will, would argue that it's uh, primarily monetary. Uh, concerns would include that um, it would uh, extend an already, you know, thinly uh, extended uh, federal monies for, for federally recognized tribes, if for, for instance, health care and Indian Health Service and other federal monies. 
Um, and then also, you know, there has been talk that they would uh, consider opening a casino, which would be very lucrative where they're uh, located. Um, at, and the only, the only recognized, federally recognized tribe um, that is in the state of North Carolina, or the Eastern Band of Cherokees. And um, they, all, they operate um, a string of very successful casinos. So it's been speculated that they would oppose it based on these, that the Alumbies would be cutting into their casino dollars. However, when you speak to uh, the tribes who have gone on the record of opposing the Alumbies, it's more a matter uh, they say of um, undermining really the power of tribal sovereignty and really what it is and what uh, really goes into um, making a tribe. A tribe that typically is a you know, culture and language. All right. Well, a reminder, you can read her story, Lumbee Goes Before Congress for Federal Recognition Again on our website. Thank you for joining us, Mary Annette. Well, thanks for having me, Patty. And thank you for watching. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Talohungva. Join us again tomorrow. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.